that our text this morning is found in the Old Testament book of Joel. Now, while y'all search for it, I'll give some backdrop to this narrative. The things that have happened in the book of Joel had already been warned that it would happen once before. You see, the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, that everybody knows, was a warning to Solomon that the Lord said, If I shut up heaven, let there be no rain. Or if I send pestilence among my people, send locusts to devour the land. Well, that is what has happened at this particular point in Israel's history. The locusts had hurt the crops of the children of Israel. They had been punished. That this is part of the punishment that they had for their disobedience and following idolatry. Then it appears that in all likelihood this was the time of this writing was in Elisha's day. And if you remember Elisha, the one that came after Elijah, there was a lot of idolatry in the land. There was a lot of folks that did not follow the Lord God himself. And the first chapter talks about how the locusts had devoured so much. And why was this? Because of a judgment against the children of Israel. And the same thing can happen to us. Can we get ourselves in such a state of disobedience that we need a wake-up call, if you will? That this is the wake-up call. Delivered by Elisha, I'm sure, the prophet. But here, Joel has a three-chapter narrative of really what 2 Chronicles 7, 4, 13, 14 looks like. So let's pick it up at Joel chapter 2, and we'll begin at verse 12. Therefore also now, saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Much like Ezra. Ezra was one that was after the Babylonian captivity. When he looked at the state of the people, of, of his people, they were he was astonished at the evil. He was appalled at it. Well, these people ought to look at their sin the exact same way. And this is to God's people. This is not talking about getting anybody to heaven. This is the ones that are going to heaven. Y'all need to listen up. Then y'all need to fast and mourn. Now, yes, fasting is also a New Testament thing. That Jesus said, when thou prayest, pray this way, when everybody knows the model prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Everybody knows that. But the next set of verses after that says, when you fast. The same way he said, when you pray, y'all do it this way. Well, when you fast, y'all do it this way. He's calling on the children of Israel. We need to do some self-examination and ask God for some assistance. Look at what we've done, and now we got to figure out what we can do to fix it. And rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Now, one thing I want to make notice of. A lot of times when they would go into these things, they would rent their mantle, which is their head covering, or their clothes, which that's an outward sign. 
But the Lord said, rend your heart. Tear your heart. Look inside your heart and see what it looks like inside your minds and your heart. See, your heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But the Lord knows it. And if the Lord knows it, can he show you what you need to know about it? Can he bring these things to you? Bring them to your mind. Put them in your mind. Put them in your heart. Do you believe it's good news to know that the Lord is merciful and slow to anger? I mean, I, I mean, have you ever done anything wrong? Are you glad that the Lord does not just take all of it out on you and banish you from His presence forever? That's what we deserve. And that's sure, for sure what the children of Israel had done. You see, the very first commandment, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, the children of Israel violated that on multiple occasions. Before we're too hard on them, do we do the same thing? Now, you may say, well, I don't have a statue in my home. I don't bow to anything. Is there anything that you place more important than serving God himself? I'll tell you, one of the biggest idols in this, in our own culture and in our own time is the, the God of self-gratification. If it feels good, do it. Well, if it's against God's word, if it feels good, it don't matter if you should do it or not. It says God says it's wrong, it's still wrong. Do, we, do you ever have any trouble with that? With the, if it feels good, do it era. Well, the bad news is, if it's against God's word, the Lord will visit you. And that's not pleasant at time, and sometimes. Because he says in the book of Revelation, whom the, wool, the Lord loveth, he what? Chasten it. The Lord loves us enough to correct us when we're going in the wrong direction. Have you ever had any trouble with that? Well, the fact that you're breathing suggests to me that you probably have. Now, verse 14 says, Who knoweth if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him, even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God? Very similar to another verse of Scripture. Let me ta turn over here to the book of Esther. That there has been a plot to destroy God's people. And Mordecai has asked Esther, which is his niece, to go before the king. Now, Esther is the wife of the king, but she, uh, the king is um, possibly not even aware of her descendants. How she is a children of the Jews. And she knew the danger of going before the king with anything. If the king does not hold out the golden scepter, she can be killed on the spot. In verse 13 of the fourth chapter of Esther, it says, Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not, with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And Esther, if you don't do this, your father's house and you yourself may very well be destroyed. Now, God's people would continue 
there would still be an enlargement of deliverance, but it wouldn't be through Esther if she holds her peace. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows if you're here at this time for this cause? For the cause of the Jews in Esther's day. Here's, here's the statement. Who knoweth if he will return and repent? Who knoweth if you have come to the kingdom for this time? Is it possible that God has sent us here to this place for this time? Now is the time to serve the Lord. Do you think it's possible that the Lord has sent you here today for the service of Him? Who knows if you have been sent to this kingdom for this time? Because I'm going to tell you, if you come to this place and take your place on your pew and pray for us, that is huge. You need to pray for this church. Pray for our minister. He needs it. I know that quite well. Pray for his church and people wherever they are throughout the entire world. Take the talents that God gives us and make use of them. In the book of Romans chapter 12, after he tells us to present our bodies a living sacrifice, he then tells us that there are different gifts in the church, different things that people do well. Some people do other things better than others. Whatever you can do, present it. Whatever that you have, everybody's got some such as I have. Old black preacher said that one time, and that's absolutely true. Who knows if he will repent and leave a blessing? I mean, I want to ask you a question. Which sounds better, to be devoured by locusts or God leaving us a blessing? I like having a blessing a lot better. How about you? And also it says that the Lord himself, in the book of uh, Malachi chapter 3 says, they can open the store's house and pour you out a blessing and there need not be room enough to receive it. If God leaves behind a blessing... Could it be a big blessing? Hey, any blessing God gives you, though, is far better than we deserve, given our sin nature and the way we live and the way we act. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sanctify a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people to... Uh, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom come forth out of his, of, of his chamber, and let the bride out of her closet. Bring everybody together. Now that tells me, the way it reads, that I believe that the family ought to worship together. You don't need another thing for this or that as far as the worship service is concerned. Don't get me wrong. Don't have anything against having us cook out together at this place. I don't have a problem with that. But the worship of his people, the children and the families ought to worship together as a unit. Because the message, that if the Lord blesses the message, it's as good for the young folks as it is for the older folks. If the Lord blesses it, 
It can be a benefit from everyone, from Bryson all the way to Brother Ronnie. If the Lord's in the arrangements for such a thing. This message is for the new build at church. The word of God is for every elect child of God, no matter their age. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? He's saying let the priests and the ministers pray that the Lord will spare us. Do you think that we need to pray the same thing? Now, and when he said, he said, bring uh, all the people together. So let's take a look at the book of Hebrews real quick. I'll turn over there. You don't have to go there. Hit book of Hebrews chapter 10. In verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast our, the profession of our faith without wavering, for he that is faithful that promised us. Let us consider one another to provoke one another to love, unto love and, un, and to, good, to good work not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Let's come together and let's exhort one another. Let's encourage one another. Encourage the ministry. Encourage one another to good works, whatever those good works are. Whatever that gift that we talked about, Romans chapter 12 that you have, let's pray that we can cultivate those things. Let's pray that the Lord may spare our church for another week till we come back again next week at this same time. Pray that the Lord will bless this nation. And I don't know how far this nation will go. And maybe, maybe the time that we have the locusts come and destroy our land. I don't know. It looks pretty bleak. It doesn't change the job. It says that the priests and ministers weep. And pray. Can we come together to pray to our God? Is it worth our time to pray to our God? Is this place worth it? Whether this nation survives, goes on, the nation may fall. I don't know. It's not my job to know. Our job is to gather ourselves together, call for the time that we come together to weep, to preach, to pray, to sing, and see if the Lord will bless it. Bless it in our homes, bless it in our churches, and maybe the effect will have will take in the entire nation. We don't know. But I will tell you, the start of the work and the thing of revival will start at home. It will start at God's house and at your house that contains God's house in it. The church is you. You are the church. This is just a building. We was talking about before the church, uh, services started, talked about Wilson Creek, how their church building was used as a hospital during the Civil War. And the building that's at Walter Hill, the original building was torn down by the Union uh, soldiers and used for supplies during the Civil War. This church building has been here since 1879, I believe is the year. But this building is not the church. This church was organized in 1809. That's when this church started. 213 years. The church is about you. This church lives in lives on in us. 
whether this building is here or not. I'm thankful for comfortable buildings. Elder Sam Bryant preached on that. I've got the sermon in my car on a CD. Now, I'm thankful for comfortable buildings in the places that we have to worship. But this church, if this building were gone, I pray this church would continue. It might wind up like the church said, uh, that is spoken of in the book of Colossians that's in someone's house. Many, many of the churches met in under trees and in caves in the first century and in the homes. But what is the most important part of the church? The foundation, Jesus Christ. If he's here with us. If he does, as the next verses read, read in the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous over his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his inner part toward the utmost sea. And his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he hath done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad. And rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Do you think the Lord can still do great things? Well then, folks, fear not. You see, we've been talking about whether or not we know whether or not the nation will rise or fall, and the things that are going on in the nation with the wars and the things and the fact that COVID-19 appears to be back with some force. Fear not. Why? Because the Lord will do great things. With all the chaos that's around you, can the Lord still do great things in His church and in His people? You see, you got to remember... Think about the book of Revelation. We talked about Revelation and we kind of lost, left off on that. I need, we need to get back to it. But those people in the book of Revelation, those seven churches in Asia, were under a, intense persecution. One of the members of one of those churches had a martyr, one that died for his profession of the Lord Jesus Christ, and all of them were in that danger at all times. They were in a very, very, very wicked place. Are we in a very wicked place? Well, we are because we're among sinners. And we always will be. But they continued to strive. Or two of them at least had no thing that they were told specifically to repent of. And there were several churches that had good works that they had done but may have left off or not done some things they should have done. That's why we need to search ourselves and ask the Lord to search us and rend our hearts and see whether we have the same problem. You see, think about this. You have the books that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches. He wrote Romans to the church at Rome, Ephesians to the church at Ephesus, and so on. In those seven churches that were written to in Asia Minor by the book of Revelation, you could substitute in your church's name and read it as it was to your church because this word is to you. You want to see how the church ought to operate? Those are letters to churches. You just substitute the name Bildad into where it says Ephesus. And this church, and those letters become very real, don't they?
and the Lord can bless it. But if we don't do what he says, he can leave it desolate. That can happen. Henry Young, Henry Young had a great statement. He said, if the Lord's people wake up and do what this book says, there can be people worshiping here when the Lord comes again. That is a very true statement. That's a fantastic statement. The part that we want to warn about today, though, is the opposite may be true. If we don't do what this book says, there could be not people worshiping here in a very short time. That can happen as well. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring. For the tree beareth the fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause it to come down for you, the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. That the Lord's going to restore what had been destroyed. When they do what the Lord says, He says He'll heal their land. Like I said, the first and second chapter of the book of Joel is very much like an expanded version of 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And he said, I'll heal the land. And listen to what it says next. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. We should not be ashamed of our Lord. Has He done great things for us? Has He delivered us to this point? He's blessed us greatly, hasn't he? In this particular, he said that he had blessed them to reclaim all the things that the first chapter talked about, the pestilence, the locusts that devoured everything, and then everything that devoured the locusts, and everything that... It was, a, it was a bad time. But the Lord said, I'll restore it. Where does the restoration start? Where does the healing of the land start? Search with my people that call by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. That's what this is all about. The children of Israel had done what the Lord had warned would happen if they did it. And now they need to repent. We need to repent when the Lord sees us in those situations. We need to ask the Lord to rend our hearts, rend our minds, and have it where we see what we need to know. We have a a hymn that we sing sometimes called Search Me, O Lord. And we pray that the Lord would search us. And show us the direction that we need to go. So that the Lord may heal this land, this church. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. And I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward 
that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants, upon the handmaids, in those days I will pour out my spirit. How wonderful would it be if the Lord would pour out his spirit again? They said the old men shall dream dreams and they shall hear have these things. Well, folks, can the Lord bless us with a knowledge of his word? Can he pour out his spirit that you would understand the things that are read? I can understand the things that were studied that we may bring honor and glory to him. Can we have the time, the seasons of refreshing, if the Lord will bless with His Spirit? I believe we can. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Deliverance is in the Lord. Deliverance for this church to continue is found in the Lord alone. Deliverance for ourselves is in the Lord alone. We need to look to Him for help and guidance. We need to look to Him for our deliverance. All those things that can happen can still happen. The Lord can still chastise His people. But can the Lord still deliver us? A remnant. You see, think about this in the terms of a remnant. That Elijah looked at the situation and he thought he was all alone. But the Lord said, there's still 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal or kissed his image. Now, 7,000 in some ways, we think that's quite a few folks, right? I don't think we could put 7,000 people into this building. Have to bring out the folding chairs for sure then. I need an amplifier to be able to talk to all of them. But think about 7,000 among the millions of people that were among the children of Israel. The nation of Israel. There was one group that still believed in the truth. And there still be a group of people that still believe the truth and believe it's important to turn from our wicked ways. And God still bless a church to stand for the truth. And I'm not, I think that it's a good thing for churches to grow in number. I, I believe that. I believe in evangelism. I believe that we ought to be out spreading these things wherever the Lord gives us opportunity. But I want the people that are here to worship the truth, Lord in truth. And that's where the deliverance, and that's where the, what the message is about is the Lord ought to be our focus. The Lord ought to be our helping guidance. And this word is the instruction manual for how to do that. If you want to know what the Lord is looking for in us, consult His word.
Turn from our wicked ways. Ask the Lord to search us. And give us one more opportunity to worship. I'm thankful for the opportunity we've had today. And I pray the Lord continues to give us opportunities to worship Him in spirit and in truth. But let's call ourselves together to pray and seek the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you as effort.